Funding for Virginia Homegrown is made possible by Strange's Florist, Greenhouses, and Garden Centers. Serving Richmond for over 75 years, with two florist shops, two greenhouses, and a garden center. Located throughout the metro Richmond area. Strange's, every bloom in time. Wild Birds Unlimited, providing bird food, feeders, and garden accessories. Products to enjoy nature in your own backyard. New location next to Wegmans in Midlothian, and also at Pump Road and Three Chopped. And by the Nanshard Morganson Charitable Fund. Hi, I'm Peggy Singleman, host of Virginia Homegrown, and in the first half of our show, we'll be learning about butterfly gardens with butterfly specialist Marcus Gray. And I'm Pat McCafferty. In the second half of the show, we're heading to Tufton, a satellite farm of Monticello, where we'll check out their innovative irrigation ideas, as well as their farm-to-cafe vegetable garden and some interesting plants. We love taking those garden questions, so go ahead and send them in via Facebook, phone, or email, and stay tuned to Virginia Homegrown. Gosh, it's been hot out in that garden, but cooler weather is coming and so is the rain. I'm Peggy Singleman and welcome to Virginia Homegrown. And I'm Pat McCafferty. In the second half of the show, I'm taking us to Tufton Farm, where Peggy Cornett, who's the curator of plants, will be showing us some very interesting and beautiful varieties of historical significance. We love taking those garden questions from home, so send them in via Facebook, phone, or email. And Peggy, where are we heading now? Well, we're, Pat, we're going to be staying here in town in Richmond, and we're going to be with Marcus Gray, a butterfly specialist. And we're going to learn more about those beautiful butterflies fluttering in our gardens and how we can attract more. So let's get going. You know, Marcus, I really appreciate you taking the time to come here because here at Maymont we have Marie's Butterfly Trail, and we recently redesigned it, and it's so nice to have an expert here to help evaluate it because I do know there are certain components to a successful garden. So what are those components? Well, you want to be able to provide resources for the entire life cycle. So uh -huh. you want to be able to have the caterpillar food plants in addition to nectar sources for the adults. So there's some plants here in the garden that will provide food for the caterpillars as well right. as that, the nectar source for the adults. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, Baptizi here, uh, false indigo, right. people call. We've got dill, um, and then we've got the switchgrass here, which is actually a food source for a lot of skipper butterflies. Oh, fantastic. So, so it's very important to have that caterpillar stage, of course. Of course, yes, because without caterpillars, you don't have butterflies. <laughs> don't have the butterflies. So that's right, yes. that's right. But then after that, what else can we put into our gardens for a successful butterfly garden? Well, you want to be able to provide shelter from wind and rain as well. So tree cover is important, especially conifers. People don't think about that. Like in my own garden, we have a, a line of uh, Atlantic white cedar to where butterflies can get in if the weather turns bad because you want to prevent wind from being able to blow hard through your garden because it makes it difficult to fly. And I can imagine, how, is it, how do they fly in the rain? Well, most of them don't. You know, it's, it's sort of, they want to get out of the weather if it's, if it's bad just because a raindrop knocking them to the ground and damaging their wings could be fatal. Um, so, you know, things like cabbage whites uh, that are used to a European climate where it rains a little more uh -huh. are more likely to be out in, in dicey weather than our native butterflies. Interesting, are, so. very interesting. So we need shelter. Correct. And now what else are we needing to provide? So with the nectar sources, you want to provide flowers that are easy to land on, mm -hmm. um, you know, the humble shape, uh, so that butterflies are able to rest while they're feeding. Well, they've got to put that long proboscis right That's down right. under that That's flower. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, to get the nectar. So they yes. want to have a good, safe um, standing spot. Exactly. So all of our flat-shaped flowers are better. Correct. And maybe flowers that are stacked like goldenrod and such? Yes, yes. So things that provide a, a larger surface area mm -hmm. for them to be able to get a good footing on. That's correct. Excellent. And then what else? Because, I mean, we've got the flower part, but are there particular colors that we want to add in our garden? Yeah, so because of the way butterflies see, uh, purples are, are preferred, but then anything bright colored, oranges, yellows, things that will, will grab our attention as humans and we think, oh, that's poisonous. Um, you know, that is attractive to butterflies because they lay their eggs on plants that provide toxins a lot to prevent predation. So if you can provide those plants in nectar and 
in uh, unison, then you're you'll attract more butterflies. Ooh, the classic milkweed. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, anything in the milkweed family, the caterpillars eat that, and they accumulate the toxins in their body, um, and then they become distasteful to birds. And that bright coloration just is a signal that d telegraphs, hey, I'm not good to eat. You don't want to eat me. So. Leave me alone. Yeah, that's right. I might be pretty, but leave yes. me alone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. that's fantastic. So do we plant onesies, twosies, or do we want large spreads of flowers? So you want to plant in large batches, you know, depending on your budget. But if, <laughs> if you know, some of these plants do spread out over time. So this is a process. You, you mm -hmm. don't want to invest worry about investing all your money all in one season mm -hmm. you know build incrementally you, know, you can have a mix of natives and non-natives you want to focus on natives because a lot of these native plants provide the caterpillar food plant butterflies when they're adults will nectar a variety of of flowers um, but those caterpillars are specifically tied to that family of plants or even in some cases that specific species of plant. Interesting. So you know we've got the Baptisia back here and the wild indigo dusky wing is one of the butterflies that a lot of people think looks like a moth. Yeah. It's a spread wing skipper. Um, their caterpillars can eat nothing else. And you were telling me earlier about violets have a very specific yes. butterfly. Yeah so you'll see here um, in the garden that there's variegated fritillary. Mm -hmm. um, there's two groups of butterflies. You go farther south there's heliconians or long wings and they their caterpillars feed exclusively on passion flower. And then you've got uh, true fritillaries like um, the great spangle fritillary here that you'll see that feed on violets, you know, things in the viola family, so even pansies. Um, but there's native violets in your yard mm -hmm. that everybody gets the urge to mow their yard right in the spring, right at the time of the caterpillars yes. getting to the, they eat the flower, <laughs> so they get to the top of the flower and then everybody mows. Oh. And then they go, where'd my butterflies go? Yeah. But, but these variegated fritillaries are sort of a transition between the two groups, and so they'll use both. They'll, they'll lay their eggs on either passion flower, or maypop, people call mm -hmm. them, or um, violets. I don't pull as many violets as I used to, I'll be <laughs> That's honest. Good. That's I'm, good. Tr I'm changing, I'm changing. <laughs> But over here, I know we have a big, large swath and such. So um, there's some other components. Why don't we come on over sure. here and we can explain yeah, those as well. Great. Over here, we have some good basking rocks for butterflies to be able to dry off and warm mm -hmm. up in the morning. You know, we had rain last night, so it's a little difficult for them to get flying this morning. Right. They're starting to wake up now pretty well. Um, but then these moist spots actually provide a place. You know, it doesn't have to be open water, standing water, so you don't attract mosquitoes. But you can have a moist spot where um, adult butterflies, especially males, can imbibe nutrients from the soil, salts from the soil itself, and they uh, will do that quite frequently, especially after rain on a hot, hot day. We were at Douthat State Park, and I rounded the bend, and there was a puddle after rain, and there must have been about 40 monarchs just yeah. all into that wonderful clay and puddling. It was a puddle of orange. It was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I've never seen that here, but I have seen one or two down in there. Yeah, it just it really depends on the time of year and, and what's lacking. Mm -hmm. in, in the environment at the time. Uh, you go down southeast of Richmond and go down to Big Woods Wildlife Management right. Area, you'll see along the roads um, down there where there's a lot of fire, mm -hmm. um, you know, where they do a lot of prescribed fire and that ash, you know, mixing with the water and the clay, I think they, they like that sort they of like thing. So if you, can, if you can replicate the, those sorts of environments, you know, you can, you can bury a bucket in the, in the ground, flush with the ground and, and fill it with sand and just keep that moist, mm -hmm. um, that can provide those nutrients. And then people can, you can, you can create a fruit feeder, uh, you know, something you want to make a little raccoon proof or, mm -hmm. or wasp proof you can take a, a tray and put um, banana uh, watermelon you know other melons and you can uh, put a little wire screen or a hardware cloth or something like right. that and then uh, hang that and that'll attract because the butterflies will be able to stick their proboscis down in there but wasps and things won't be able to reach it excellent so. we'll have to do that because there's some butterflies that don't visit flowers <laughs> yes 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 yeah. but speaking of we have such a wonderful yes. array of picnanthemum the mountain yes mint. mountain mint yeah that's exactly right and this this is a heavy hitter in the garden um, you know you want a mix of perennials annuals and biennials in your mm -hmm. garden just to provide that diversity um, but you know this is a go-to standard plant mm -hmm. where it'll spread probably at a medium rate to make a clump, and it mm. takes time, but once you get it, it just attracts all sorts of bees and butterflies. But these perennials here, we've got a nice you know, succession yes, right here that exactly. I'm very proud of, because yep. I've got the Achillea, which is the yarrow the Yarrow, there, yep. You know, and then I have right now our Picnanthemum, the mountain mint. Yes. But yet in the future, I've got the ironweed coming on yes. for later on yes, in the season. Yes, something to look forward to. Yeah, yes, that's right. yes, yes, and it's purple. <laughs> yes, that's, that's great. Yeah, like I say, I, I like to come to this garden, you know, even though the revamp is relatively new, you put a lot of good work into it, and it's an enjoyable place to come because everything is is compact and, and tight and you're attracting a lot here because the surrounding trees provide more caterpillar food than people might realize you know tiger swallowtails their mm -hmm. caterpillars eat yellow poplar tulip poplar um, and, and black cherry and then you've got oak trees provide resources for about 400 different species so yes. it's butterflies and moths well so. Marcus thank you those are kind words and high praise and I, I, I appreciate it me. 
Thank, Thank you. you. And we've got some exciting things to be able to out, go out and improve all of our own butterfly gardens. So I appreciate the information. Yeah, my pleasure. Marcus, what people don't realize is how hot that day was. Yes. <laughs> I think we were melting. We were. And well, we have so much more to share. And before we get going, I just want to remind everybody to remember to bring in your gardening questions via phone call, Facebook, or email. Send them on in so we can get to them at the rest of the show and answer them all. So, Marcus, you know, I know that we were in a beautiful butterfly garden, but there's other areas that we don't think about where there's butterflies. Right. I mean, the benefit of these formal gardens and you can accomplish a lot in a small area for butterflies in your yard or in a community space but really the benefit is drawing attention to larger landscape level conservation just in the last 30 years butterflies have declined by half oh my. so we really need to provide this habitat on a large scale and so I'm actually working with golf courses with Audubon International and the superintendent golf courses through a program called Monarchs in the Rough where we're creating at least one acre of new habitat for monarchs and other pollinators on golf courses across the country. That is a that's just awesome because there's Appreciate every community has some um, some golf courses. So exactly, it's a great project. Thank you for undertaking that. Yeah, but you. also, golf courses don't have the flower gardens. So what do they have that are helpful right. to the butterflies? Right. So, so a lot of courses they have um, outlying areas that have a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, talk here about um, we've got plants like the pawpaw, which is our largest native fruit, sort right. of tropical looking. Yes. Um, but it's actually the caterpillar food plant for the zebra swallowtail. And this cute little guy right yes, here. Yes, yes. And so people really enjoy seeing those. And then things like the tulip poplar here, uh, yellow poplar that we talked about, um, they actually go with the eastern tiger swallowtail Which there is in the right top up through here. Yes, yes. ma'am. Um, and so really we want to think about how you can draw attention to these larger landscape level initiatives, but then what you can do at home locally. And so don't discount places like your, your herb garden. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got some fennel here, and um, that's actually one of the host plants for the black swallowtail She's and right that's right and that's um, anything in the carrot family there's actually a native plant called golden alexander yes. that they'll use but they've switched to introduce plants like dill and fennel mm -hmm. um, queen anne's lace things like uh, things of that nature i have to give a warning on golden alexander though because i collected some seeds and i put them in one of the gardens at maymont and oh my was it very very happy yes there. yes <laughs> it can it can spread i mean that's that's a lot of these pollinator plants are open grown, disturbed site pioneer type plants so they get a foothold early and reproduce uh, rapidly before the trees can close back in on them. It was very good at reproducing <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> that's right. But that's there's right. another, you know, we've got another one. Yeah, so there. we've got um, some chives here. Um, that's a good nectar source for mm -hmm. adult butterflies. So, you know, think about when you're growing plants, cultivating plants to eat, that you can have multiple benefits. I mean, you're planting a butterfly garden also for things to eat. So, you know, you don't get too um, worked up about what might be eating the plants. Just keep an eye on it and try to use um, more natural means of, of pest control if you can. But also in the springtime, people think about, you know, we're in the height of the summer right now yes. and there's so many, you know, nectar plants out. But what's available in the springtime? Right, so some early uh, spring nectar sources are things like this red bud here. Mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of people don't realize the early spring butterflies will actually go to red bud. And then we have spice bush on the other side of the table here, and that blooms real early before the leaves come out even. Okay, so who here on the boxes? Oh. So, so the spice bush swallowtail will lay its eggs on, on spice bush and sassafras. Right. And those are the only things their caterpillars can eat. Um, and red bud, there are some smaller butterflies uh, called elfins and others that will use that nectar source early in spring before the larger butterflies really start flying. Okay, I'm just going to bring us back to this because in sure. this collection provided by VCU's um, entomology department, mm -hmm. um, the, some, we think of butterflies as large, but there's a lot of little guys here too. So Correct. What, how do you determine a, a butterfly from a moth? Right, so there's a couple of different things. The shape of the antenna, mm -hmm. you know, butterflies tend to have clubs where moths will have more of a feathery look to them. Um, and then you know, there's a lot of day flying moths, but butterflies tend to be diurnal, you know, active during the day. But um, bright coloration versus mm -hmm. less bright coloration. There yeah. are some moths that do have some good colors, you know, if you look underneath, but um, they're not as, as striking most of the time as butterflies are. Okay. So well, butterflies good. descended from moths. Oh. <laughs> so the, so the, they got back. dressed up for the party. That's right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, so we've got uh, the monarch here in, in the top corner there, and the host plant for that is actually the 
uh, anything in the milkweed family. So this is butterfly weed, orange, orange milkweed, um, and their caterpillars feed on that. So you may have, may have heard of that. We talked a little bit about that when we were walking around their garden. Yes, we did, and how important to introduce milkweeds back into our landscapes. Yes. And not just our landscapes, but on our highways and byways where they exactly. used to be. That's so right. So that we can provide enough food to get our monarchs flying from north to south and back down. South That's to right. north and back down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, and so like so we've got a few examples here of of uh, some summer blooming plants, mm -hmm. uh, zinnias that, that Peggy's looking at there. And they continue to bloom all summer, so they're very good to put in yes, the garden. Yes, and the, you, know, the, you deadhead them, they'll get bushy and, and continue mm -hmm. blooming. They're, exactly. they're very good. I try to use single bloom varieties mm -hmm. if you can. Yes. Um, and then we've got yeah, some phlox there. And then um, some Joe, Joe Pye weed. That, that's putting on a show right now in the wild or any, any restored sites, if you go and look, mm -hmm. roadsides, moist sites. So if you've got a wetter spot like a rain garden, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a fantastic plant for that. Um, and then we've got hyssop or right. um, agastache. Yes. Yeah, that's a very aromatic plant. Driving here, it smelled up the inside of my truck. Oh, well, <laughs> so it's very yes. pleasant. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah very I like pleasant. That one. But um, that's a plant that you go, if you go to buy one at the store, it's got pollinators all over it. Yes. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, <laughs> it you, you take it out of the car and put it on the table, and, <laughs> and it's there got they bees are. on it. Yeah. Yes. Um, so. But to extend the season, too, you've got some sedum here yes, that's so still that's in a, bud. Right. So that's a great uh, fall blooming plant mm -hmm. um, that gets sort of past goldenrod. And a little later in the season, it's a stone crop. Uh -huh. So it's a, a succulent plant that has a little different texture to a garden, too, a lot of the time. So it's, again, it's important things spring, summer, yes. fall, so that we can provide um, the nectar and the host plants and the, um, that are needed all season long. That's great. So, exactly. Marcus, thank you so much. This thank has been a joy me. to be able to have butterflies connected with plants so that we can see that there is a direct correlation and that it goes just beyond the flowers in our garden but into our trees and our shrubs as well. Thank so, you for having me. Yes. And now we're going to go to the plant of the month at the Edith J. Carrier Arboretum at James Madison University. Hi, and welcome to the Edith J. Carrier Arboretum at James Madison University. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Jan Severs Mahan. I'm the director here at the Arboretum. And we're in full summer mode. It's July, it's hot, and the annuals are all abloom. Today, we wanna to focus on this beautiful plant. It's called Rockin' Deep Purple. It's a salvia. If we take a little snip of it, and I can show you that it's got this beautiful square stem here, and has also these beautiful deep purple, almost black calyxes or calyces that support the uh, flower that comes out. And it also has a nice scent. This plant is amazing because it blooms from spring to frost. It's low maintenance, it's deer resistant, and it stays compact. So it goes great in a container if you wanted to use it as a thriller or a filler. And this plant pairs so beautifully with Snow Fairy Caryopteris, and also with the Helen von Stein lamb's ear, the geranium rosan, uh, green santalina, and a host of other annuals that you might want to mix with it, like coleus and some grasses. So it's a great border plant. And the thing that I really love about this plant, and I've, why I've chosen it as the plant of the month, is that it's uh, low maintenance. You don't need to deadhead this plant. It's heat tolerant. It'll bloom until spring through fall to frost. And it's a veritable hummingbird, butterfly, and bee magnet. It's a really wonderful plant, and I recommend that you try it. I'm a salvia person. I love growing salvias because they're just gorgeous all summer long and they're great for the pollinators. So I encourage you to look into that. And speaking of, I also encourage you to go to our Facebook page where we actually can um, share information and such. And we have the Virginia Homegrown Exchange videos there for you to review. And that we hope you can see on our screen there the, the link to Facebook so you can join us, you can like us. And between the shows, you can learn a lot of good gardening information as well. So, Marcus, we've got a lot of really good questions here, but I want to start off with, with sunlight for hostas because it's such a common question, and we want to make sure people are clear yes. about hostas. Greg in Chesterfield, he says his neighbor recently moved a large tree from his yard, and now the hostas, which were in the shade, are now receiving a lot more sunlight in the afternoon. And he's asking if he should consider moving them. Do either of you have experience with hostas? Yeah, I mean, I, you feel free, but I, I think, yeah, I think you should probably move them to a, a shadier site. They thrive in that type of an environment. Mm -hmm. And what time yeah. of year should he do it? Should he do it right now or? Well, I tend to move them in the, in the fall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right now, would it be a good idea maybe to put a shade cloth over it or some way to break that sunshine? I would think so, yeah. yeah. That would be a good option, yeah. 
So I, I think you've got your work cut out for you there, Greg. So, yeah. And then we have black-eyed Susans. My black-eyed Susan vine has not bloomed this year. I have them in hanging baskets on my porch. Last summer they flowered. This summer I have plenty of vines but no flowers. What should I try? Hmm. And she's talking about um, uh, Thumbergia, which is an annual vine. It's okay. called the black-eyed Susan vine. Hmm. Are you familiar with Thumbergia? I'm not, but no, it, I guess it's, it's not to be confused with the perennial or biennial yeah. mm -hmm. black-eyed yeah. Susan. Yeah. Yes. Well, Amanda, I have a Thumbergia or black-eyed Susan vine at my house too, and it is not blooming yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to do. Pardon me. <clears throat> I've been keeping it well watered, and mine gets a little shade, so it's not getting as much sun as it did last year, and I was attributing it to that. So I would encourage you to think about if you have it in another spot or maybe it's grown into a little bit more shade or are you fertilizing it a little bit mm -hmm. too much to keep it growing and not blooming. So those are all little details to consider. And that nutrient balance in your fertilizer could be really important if it's nitrogen heavy, it could be more foliage. If it exactly. sounds like an otherwise healthy plant, I know uh, uh, Phosphorus can help move the energy throughout the uh, body of the plant and make mm -hmm. it to the flowers. So get it to the flowers. Try it out. Yes. And then we have, um, um, we have patties. Do I know of anybody in the um, Virginia homegrown area who would like to rescue masonry bees? No, I don't. Mm. But I'm going to encourage you to call your cooperative extension agent and talk to them about this because they have resources such as you know, who would rescue bees, who would remove bees, that we don't have available. So I, on the screen is a list of some of the extension offices. And while you're there, you can uh, talk to people about possibly becoming a master gardener, which is a fabulous program that really helps uh, gardeners with questions and challenges such as this one here. So please contact your local cooperative extension agent. And and then um, next one we've got here is on propagating. We've got uh, Martina. Um, Watched the show uh, not that long ago about propagating, did Chinese snowballs and some hydrangeas. I started them five weeks ago and done everything accordingly. It looks like they all caught on. I got them all in the planter box. When should I take them out of the box and treat them like a normal plant? Um, have you been doing any propagating? Not of those varieties. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm getting a little late in the year for, for me, but um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, as Marcus just mentioned, it's timing. I would pot them up as soon as possible and to be able to then get them hardened off before the winter comes. And actually this winter I'd put them in a sheltered place, mm. someplace protected, so that they're, a little, they're buffered from the intense uh, temperature swings as well as the intense low temperatures. But I really want you to celebrate for being able to propagate the plants. I congratulate you on that and I thank you for watching. Um, and then we also have one on wounded bark. We have Nancy and she's bought two small fruit trees from a nursery that were thriving at first and putting out new growth for two years and then it began to drop its leaves that were turning yellow. Oh my. Um, after close examination, a small wire that must have been used by the nursery to label it was found embedded in the trunk. Oh, my heart is breaking. Girdling the center section of the tree, the wire was removed, but is there any treatment for the wounded bark? Can, I, can the tree recover? First answer is, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that wire. It's so important to inspect our trees and shrubs that we get from the nursery. Um, but, you know, do you have any experience with this situation, Marcus or Pat? I make, I make sure that I've learned from, from having that happen so that, uh, you know, you really have to protect it. You can use the sort of the plastic uh, casing around it if you need to protect right. the, the lower trunk from a weed whacker or from animals. Um, but you really want to keep your wires away from yes. growing young trees. Yeah, and there's some products out there that you can use to cover wounds, but I think the jury's out on whether or not they work and they may cause a moisture problem. Um, you know, keeping the site too, too wet. So Actually, it, yes, and I was going to say, and the second half is don't cover it, leave it be. Yeah trees actually seal themselves. Now if it's totally girdled and it's completely um, been cut off, the nutrients have been cut off because right underneath that bark is where the xylem and phloem and the cambium layer, mm. all the action of the trees, right underneath that bark and if that's been compromised all the way around, you may have lost your tree. However, I would mulch it, I would keep it well watered, and I would not put anything on that wound and let's see what the tree does to itself. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it, if it's healthy enough, it might pull back and if not, uh, you know, it's worth a try to go back to the garden center and talk to them about it. If it's your local garden center run by a, pr a family, you know, you might be able to talk to them and explain the situation and see what they can offer. I can't make any promises. It's up to them, but hmm. I would bring it back and ask, hey, what's going on here? Um, we have another question here from um, uh, Martina. She's in the 
this person's in the second year of a pollinator garden, and last year they had monarch caterpillars about mid-June here in Dinwiddie, and this year they've only seen two so far. They're very concerned. Yeah, it, it's a thing, you know, when the population for monarchs has been reduced by 90%, sometimes it takes time to find those little new patches of habitat again, or they don't always occupy them every year because they get so spread out across the, across the continent. So just plant and be patient and, and keep doing what you're doing, and, um, you know, don't give up on them. Yeah. Should you be planting um, in the same area every year? Should you be trying to expand the planting area? What would be some good tips for people who really want to help with the Monarch program? Yeah, if you've got the ability to expand, that's fantastic, you know. Um, but, you know, planting in the same area is not normally a problem. Um, you have some varieties of, say, milkweed, the, the tropical uh, milkweed that um, dies back here. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so any sort of pest problem for monarchs isn't really a, an issue because it's more deciduous here than it would be farther yeah. south. Because mm -hmm. I know I've been trying to, um, at Maymont, trying to expand the milkweed population. Mm -hmm. by, and, uh, and I'll be honest, I, I collect seed in the wild. Yeah. And I disperse it, but I don't collect it all. I only take a little bit um, right. just to get myself going so that then I can collect the seed and distribute it amongst on the property. Yeah, I think Which it's is having a net benefit, beneficial yeah. effect to the overall populations if yes. you're growing it in a new place. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more that of an issue for the plants. You know, if you've got a powdery mildew issue or something, you know, with your zinnias, you know, maybe don't plant them <laughs> yes. there again. You know, you just have to take it as it comes. Rotate and, and adapt. it as it can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Insects are so sensitive as well to heat and to, yeah. to moisture and things like that. Yeah. So this year, I noticed in our garden where we have a uh, now becoming established pollinator garden where we get return species every year. Um, it was quite late that the, that the butterflies really emerged and we have a huge milkweed patch now and we also have not noticed the, uh, the caterpillars as early this year, but I think they're coming. Yeah, they'll be coming. Marcus said they were. <laughs> <laughs> and then Lori says, you know, oh my, I have a serious problem at my poolside. We have a mature red bud tree that I've become infested with white flannel moth caterpillar. Mm -hmm. They're a real problem. They poop in our pool and also sting if they fall on you or if you chance step on them. It's a very serious problem. Short of cutting down our wonderful red bud, any ideas on how to break their cycle? The tree is rather large to spray, plus it's around our pool. Mm. Wow. Oh, wow, this is a challenge because of the location. And because of the location, again, I'm going to ask you to reach out to a local arborist to see what they would suggest because um, there are products called BT that will actually wipe out the population, mm. but it'll also wipe out every single caterpillar exactly. in the area. But That's it's right. Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a 100% natural product. And um, because it's found naturally, it's, I don't think it'll be harming the pool or anything. Um, but that is one product you can do, but it has to get onto the caterpillar itself. So unfortunately, you're going to figure out how to spray it. Mm -hmm. And if the tree is that large, you're going to need to bring in a professional to do that. Mm -hmm. So any other suggestions? Um, yeah, if it was a smaller tree, I would say something like diatomaceous earth serves the same purpose. You know, mm -hmm. and it's more tar you know, it's targeted if you get it on the caterpillars or they're eating it themselves, then I think it would help address the problem. Yes, yes. See, lots of good suggestions mm -hmm. here, but reach out to the arborist. And always being careful to dilute it. If you're going to apply it, because I've had that happen before, where if you do it too thick, it really can kind of burn the plant. Cakes up, cakes up. Yes, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> So we have two good organic methods to try. Um, Pam in Richmond, her mature Akuba bush, the tips are turning black, not sure what is happening and how to treat it. Akubas do get a disease all summer long, and the best treatment is for you to continually remove the blackened leaves and to cut back the blackened stems, put them in a trash bag, and throw them away. It's the nature of the critter, and it's a situation that is, is best treated by just continually removing it. And you might feel in the beginning you're not getting ahead of it, but you will. And the important thing is, of course, is to clean your clippers between those clips, okay? So I want to thank you for these great questions. And folks, if you're watching and you have some more questions, please send them in via Facebook phone call or email. And right now we're going to go to Monticello's Tufton Farm and have a wonderful visit with Peggy Cornett out there. Peggy, thank you so much for having us here at Tufton Farm. It's always a treat. We were here last summer right. at a somewhat similar time, and we're back again. I think a little hotter this time. It's, we're baking today, for sure. Yeah. Yes. I think the high is 97 degrees, and we've yeah. got insects drinking our sweat. It's just really, <laughs> really a scorcher today. Yeah. Um, but the backdrop of that is so important to then highlight how green your plants are right now. So I would love to know, without a shade cloth, mm -hmm. um, how you keep your plants looking so nice and green uh, in pots here at Tufton Farm. There are thousands of, of potted plants out here in the nursery, but uh, one solution we found is to install aquamats underneath ah. the, the, the pots, and they're fed by water from a hose on a timer, mm -hmm. and so the plants are actually 
uh, through osmosis or drinking up the water from the mm -hmm. roots, which is much healthier. Uh, we don't have the overhead spraying and getting water on the foliage, and uh, it really helps. We do have to do a little bit of spot watering, but basically uh, lots of plants are getting watered in a very, very efficient way. Well, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> I hadn't seen those before, and then yeah. the plants are able to drink deep when they're that's in those right. pots Which instead of just sort of want. on the surface. Sur superficial watering, yeah. Mm -hmm. So amongst this, the sea of green and your natives and your sort of specialty plants that you have here, Tufton, I see one that's looking a little yellower than the rest, but that's okay for this plant. What is this one right here? Oh, that's the bleeding heart uh -huh. that uh, blooms in the springtime, one of the ornamental varieties. Uh -huh. It's actually a species. It has big big pink red heart-shaped flowers, right. but it's going dormant right now, so that's why it's starting to turn yellow. That's perfectly normal. It's supposed to happen, and let it, let it be. Don't yes. cut it off. You it needs it those nutrients to go back down. It can start drying out a little bit soon, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Um, I was just on a hike yesterday at St. Mary's Wilderness mm -hmm. area and saw a bleeding heart that was in bloom that did have kind of bushy foliage. Yeah. Is that the same type? No, it's a wonderful native species. The native one will keep blooming all summer. Uh -huh. and has some beautiful blue-green foliage. It's it's very very nice. Yes. So make a choice: foliage all summer right. or that big spring pop of that those red bleeding hearts. Perfect. Yeah, that's right. All yeah. right. So I see that you've got your aquamats here. You have your your hose here for hand watering. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of gardeners have an issue in the summertime. It's a bit counterintuitive, but with runoff. So you think the earth might absorb the water, but mm -hmm. with the Virginia red clay, it sometimes gets too baked to do so. So I see that you guys have come up with a solution yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. It's really great. We should go check it out. All right, let's check it yeah. out now. Well, a number of years ago, we realized we were creating a little lake down here with all the runoff from the cold frames when we mm -hmm. watered them. There's pipes running underground. Uh -huh. And uh, so we had an idea to make a rain garden. Uh, it, they were coming into vogue at that point. Mm -hmm. And so we dug an area out and, and filled it with some really uh, uh, moisture retaining soil and uh -huh. peat and that sort of thing. And then planted some shrubs and, and perennials that really liked the water. Well, Peggy, it's beautifully designed, and I love that you incorporated both the uh, rocks that were found on site and some river rocks here. So um, what kind of plants will tolerate wet feet in a rain garden like this? Well, we have the uh, winterberry holly, which is uh -huh. one of my favorites. This is a, a female plant, so it has, uh, it'll make these beautiful red berries in the fall. The male is just up the hill a ways. Um, we have cardinal flower, mm -hmm. and um, the ironweed is one of my favorite mm. uh, perennials, that beautiful kind of electric purple blue color. Yes, and late in the season too, late where everything's in the season. sort of getting yellow. Yes, one of the great <laughs> asters out here. Uh -huh. And uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch the things uh, growing and, and blooming at different different times of the year as well. Absolutely, so. great win-win solution for yeah. uh, working with the, the landscape on yeah. your property. Well, just one really fun thing, it's uh, just worth mentioning that uh, as we were walking down here, we saw a very unusual plant that's more likely found in a forest. What yeah. is that plant? The Indian pipes, is, uh -huh. uh, uh, I believe the Latin name is Monotropus, uh -huh. if I recall. Uh, it doesn't make chlorophyll, so it's pure mm -hmm. white, and it, it's actually a parasite on roots of, of, of trees. That's right, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I heard last time that you guys were planning on growing some vegetables here at yes. Tufton, so let's go check out the progress on that. We're growing one acre of produce, and it's all going to Monticello's Farm Table Cafe. We're actually growing 40 different types of vegetables, and we wow. have 130 cultivars within that. Wow, amazing. So what are some of the, the dishes at the cafe that we could look for some of your produce that you're growing here at Tufton? One of the main ones is we have a Monticello salad uh -huh. and we strive to grow everything that's in that. So okay. we've got shaved beets, we've got fennel, we've got all lettuces grown here, uh, baby kales, arugula, uh -huh. that sort of thing. Wonderful. So a lot of people may be curious as to which varieties that you're growing are from the Jeffersonian era. Are there any or just more modern ones? There are. It's actually a mix of different things. So we've got the cow's horn okra. We've mm -hmm. got um, a few different types of beans like asparagus bean, case knife pole bean, uh -huh. and we've got Weathersfield uh, red onions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've got quite a bit, but it's a mix really of modern cultivars and older varieties. Fantastic. So I see the sort of little um, fallow section where you've already harvested and on our way in, we were looking at beautiful bunches of garlic and onions that we're curing. So can you tell us a bit about those? Yeah, so actually just this last week, we went ahead and did a group harvest. We got about 300 pounds of potatoes. Not bad for the inaugural year. Wow. Really, we're gonna be ramping up production and eventually expanding this to multiple acres. But in mm -hmm. this first year, we're finding out about the fertility needs of the soil. Mm -hmm. And so we grew 13 different types of garlic. Again, we're, cr we're really trying to kind of sample different types to find sure. out which configuration is going to produce the best for us here in Central Virginia. Gotta find out what works. Um, the corn that you're showing us right now is uh, has a story. Can you tell us that corn story? Sure does, yeah. So the, the corn variety is actually called Cox Prolific Corn. Uh -huh. 
and uh, it's named after John Hartwell Cock, who mm -hmm. was a friend of Thomas Jefferson's. It was grown at the, Bl the Brimo Plantation here in Virginia. Oh, Brimo, And at sure. one point, it was one of the most widely grown corn types. It's a dent corn, so it's mm -hmm. used for cornmeal and grits across the en entire southern U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, it, um, it was not really known to have been grown by any uh, farmers. And a few years back, a mm -hmm. food historian by the name of David Shields, who's mm -hmm. been a presenter at our Heritage Harvest Festival, mm -hmm. found this variety, and he gifted it to us. We grew it out last year, wow. and we're growing it here at Tufton this year in order to get a seed crop. Very cool, very cool. And um, I've even be told, been told there are some top secret varieties that we can't even talk about yet. So I think that's really, really fun that you guys are always uh, kind of pushing the envelope with that sort of thing. Stay and tuned. We're looking forward to that, the grand reveal as always. That's right. Um, so there are a couple other projects that are happening now. So every time we're here, we, we love uh, learning what's on the horizon. So what, what are you doing other than this acre of uh, farm to table production? So we've got uh, beef cattle out here, and then most recently we've actually expanded to 50 beehives in a third mm -hmm. apiary site. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be bottling and selling honey year-round at the Monticello shop. And you all will be working with birds as well, is that right? Yeah, so we actually partnered with Virginia Working Landscapes. That's mm -hmm. a program of the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And we did a citizen survey science project out here. They came out and surveyed and listened for different birds in mm -hmm. order to get some baseline information on what mm -hmm. wildlife species we have out here. Mm. So I really love that you guys do your research and do your homework so well at Monticello and Tufton. And so to solve one of your nutrient deficiencies, you have found just the right cover crop for one of your beds. So could, could you talk about that? Sure, absolutely. So we have extensively soil tested. And what we found is we're actually just deficient in phosphorus. But otherwise, we've got great soil organic uh, matter out here. And we try to manage all this production organically. Mm -hmm. So we are very keen as we replace beds to put in a cover crop. And buckwheat has been one of the ones that is, uh, is great at accessing phosphorus stores. Mm -hmm. and releasing that back into the soil. Very good, and just so good for, for the health of the soil long term to make sure you're putting those nutrients back in. It's all really about the soil. Right. Well, Keith, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for all this work, and can't wait to try that Monticello salad at Monticello Cafe. Yeah, thank you very much, Patrick. Right. Appreciate it. Well, Peggy, thank you again so much for having us out there. What I love about you all out at Tufton and Monticello is you put so much into the research of finding what was uh, uh, an amazing story from back in the day, mm -hmm. um, something that's uh, cutting edge that we can grow in Virginia. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. all of that time and, and effort that you put into finding cool plants to share with us. And it's amazing how much relates to Thomas Jefferson, you know, 200 years ago. So it really does. That's, that's part of the fun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to jump into some of those plants, okay. but first I want to make sure that we remember that there's still time to send in your questions from home. So go ahead and send us an email, a Facebook message or just call on in. Um, so we have something yeah. starting from, from this side and going yeah. on down, something of, of significance to someone other than Jefferson. What is that on the... Well, um, I brought in a little bit of everything because so much is going on in the garden right now. Uh -huh. But uh, these are some Lewis and Clark plants. And of course, Jefferson commissioned that exploration of the yeah. West. And uh, some of the plants they encountered on the, on the travels included the snow on the mountain, which is become so kind of a popular uh, cut flower now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's quite, quite lovely in the garden. And it's been looking like this uh, for about a month now. And next to that is uh, Gallardia, which is very, po very mm -hmm. common, uh, but it is a, a, a flower that they also brought back from the West. Um, in the front, I have a seed packet that shows um, Gallardia uh, painted uh, by a, a local artist who is doing mm. new art packs for us at oh. and Monticello. Beautiful they're packets, lovely. and they're painted from the plants uh, collected from the gardens at Monticello, so it's oh, it's cool. uh, not from photographs or anything. Very local. Yeah, yes. and then some other um, interesting things include, you know, globe amaranth. It's, it's mm -hmm. always a great um, uh, flower throughout the summer at Monticello. And drying flower and, as well. And wonderful. For drying, and then I, I was so pleased. To, I this is sort of an experiment. Um, Jefferson grew this four o'clock. It's a, um, a night blooming plant, um, and it's, he called it sweet scented marvel of Peru. And so when I picked it today, it was all closed up, and it's open since we've been here. And you can see these beautiful uh, red stamens uh, that come out of the center of, of this long tubular flower. Yes. Of course, obviously night uh, moths and that's going to need a long proboscis to pollinate that right, or to that. get the nectar from that. Exactly. <laughs> and then I'm moving on. I brought a few plants from the from Tufton Farm that are plants that are sold at the shop mm -hmm. that are also important significant plants in our, our garden uh, including the sea kale which is a perennial mm -hmm. kale that uh, Jefferson grew and we blanch that in the springtime and and uh, cut cut it and and harvest it when it's uh, totally white under the pots. It is so tasty and it's, it's really had, good, has a yeah. very different texture from regular kale. Kale similar in flavor, similar in the overall shape and structure, mm -hmm. but it's got that like 
thick. How would you describe kind of Almost waxy? Like, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a lot thicker and more substantial, and it's it's really satisfying. It's very uh, nice. I, I felt a little better when we talked off camera, and you had said that you had a couple of rot as well, because it's yes. it's not from here. It's from well-drained soils in Eurasia. From the coast and, of England. Yeah. yeah. So many of ours have not survived, yeah. but if you can get it, it to survive. Sandy well-drained. <laughs> same same with the uh, artichokes. They also like a oh, well-drained soil. That. And this is just the, um, if you allow the choke to flower, it will make this beautiful thistle-like oh, flower, which we, we dry for um, arrangements uh, at Christmas time at Monticello. Uh, we make beautiful wreaths with these. Oh, but, um, if you're a kid again, of the 90s, you can't look at that without seeing those koosh balls that were all the, all the <laughs> yeah. craze when I was a kid. This, Perfect. That yeah. texture, that color, it's so yeah. amazing. Pollinators just cover Love those. That. Exactly. Um, yes, all of these are just full of bees all the time, and as well as butterflies. And then we're moving into the vegetable garden a little right. bit more. And um, I brought uh, some of the um, Costaluto tomatoes were shown in the mm -hmm. in the video with Keith. And uh, this is the uh, Costaluto genovese, and Costaluto mm. just means lobed. And so it's a lobed tomato from G the Genovese region of Italy. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, um, the tomatoes are from South America. And uh, so the, uh, the earliest tomatoes would look this way. They have a lot of uh, pulp and seed in them. Mm -hmm. um, but they actually, the original tomato that um, um, people used to eat was called a love apple. Mm. And this is, these are love apples. Oh, hey. And they're delicious. I mean, you can eat them like candy. So they look like large cherry tomatoes, and they're really, really nice. Yes. And another um, vegetable from South America that we tend to uh, think is from Europe uh -huh. are potatoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, but this particular potato is the, the maca zet, mm -hmm. and it's from Peru, and it went directly to uh, the Pacific Northwest um, by the Spaniards. So this, this is a potato that never um, traveled to Ireland and then back to the right. U.S. So, hundreds um, and hundreds of varieties from Peru. It's incredible. Oh, incredible. And um, these were you know, collected in the 1700s. And uh, so they were donated to us by um, uh, the uh, Slow Food US, okay. USA from Seattle, the Seattle uh -huh. chapter. And so we're growing these at Tupton Farm, and they're uh, used at the Farm Table Cafe. Um, it's Fantastic. a really delicious potato. Um, and Do you make a potato salad unique. out of it? Or? Um, I, I like to sa uh, saute it. Saute it, nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I brought a, a melon, which is, is uh, just so aromatic this time mm -hmm. of year. And this is the- Movie magic. As How'd you that said, Anna, Anna Rundell, Melon, or oh, Anna Rundell. Anna Rundell. I'm from Baltimore, so yeah, I got to get right. it right. I, I'm not pronouncing it right, but <laughs> but it's a melon from the the county in, in uh, Maryland called Anna Rundell, uh -huh. and it was uh, a family heirloom from the 1730s. And uh, as you can see, it, it's uh, kind of a green flesh. It's very delicious. Very beautiful. Um, a little course, ombre green to kind of oh, like an lovely. orange or yellow. Mm -hmm. It's a cantaloupe musk melon kind mm -hmm. of hybrid, and um, you I'm. I'm leaving it like this because we do collect the seed of this also. Right. Um, some more fun vegetables from the garden include the um, patty pan squash, yeah. or what we, uh, what we call patty pan. Mm -hmm. In Jefferson's day, they call it simlins. That was a very common name. Uh, these are the typical patty pans that you see here, right. pure white. Uh, Jefferson said they were an innocent vegetable, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, but this is, uh, he also noted in 1813 and 14 that he planted a warded simlin. And this is the warded simlin, and that. they're very bizarre looking, but <laughs> but they're like a uh, you know a, a winter squash sure. uh, that you can cut, uh, and, and they're white on the inside, of course, as well. Well, Peggy, uh, we have about time for one more plant, oh, and this okay. one I was hoping we'd have time to get to, and we do. So for oh, our last right. plant, okay. what is this here? Well, this is the caracalla bean, the Vigna caracalla, and it's a very fragrant flower. I brought this from my garden at home um, because my plant is about 20 years old, wow. and uh, it's um, an amazing plant that I, I allow, it, it goes dormant over the winter. I bring it in the basement and then uh, bring it out in the spring, and it's already up to the second floor of my house, but it's a very fragrant flower. Jefferson uh, said it was the most beautiful bean in the world, <laughs> and the name uh, Vigna caracala, car caracol is a word for, for spiral, um, and another common name is snail flower. snail flower. And so as the flower begins to open, as you can see, it's like kind of, oh, so it's curled up like a corkscrew, uh -huh. and then it opens up, and it, 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 the colors change to this uh, beautiful lavender and kind of a, a flesh color. And there's a little, um, I guess it's an anther in, inside there that kind of spirals out as well. So it looks like a corkscrew as well, wow. which is another common name for it. So it's a wonderful oh, cool. plant. It's uh, one of our popular plants that we, we grow. We, we can sell it in pots or um, uh, bare root All as right. well. Thank, thank you so much, Peggy. Yeah. It's definitely my new favorite plant of interest at the yeah, moment. So right. we're gonna head now to Peggy's tip from May month. Okay. Color in the
the garden is so easy to achieve in the spring and the fall, but here at Maymont, we need to achieve color all year long. And so to get that summer color, I want to share with you a few of my favorite plants. Plants that can survive the heat, but yet deliver the flowers. One of my favorite is phlox, and this cultivar here is Robert Poor. And it's a favorite of mine, not just for the color, but also because it's mildew resistant. You can see we have nice, clean foliage down here. Another cultivar of phlox that I like is David, which is white and also mildew resistant. Another favorite plant of mine, which some people say get invasive, but it's perfect for the shade, is our Japanese anemones here. And this one here starts blooming in July. And they're just so beautiful and floriferous through the late summer and into the fall. Another way to add color to the garden is with foliage. And in this garden, we like to use coleus for the beautiful red leaves and all the mottled colors that they come in. In addition, grasses add color as well. And you can use carex for a nice striped effect, or you can use some of the annual penicetums or fountain grasses for a nice red popping effect, almost a burgundy color. And speaking of foliage, textures make a big difference in the summer garden. Here we have a beautiful banana that's nice and bold. And to contrast it, we have this lovely Amsonia that's got a very soft, fine texture. Foliage is great, but I'll be honest, I do love those flowers all season long. And here at Maymont, we grow a lot of hibiscus. Red hibiscus, our hibiscus coccinea, is big and tall and bold. But also think about Lady Baltimore as well as Lord Baltimore hibiscus. The Lady Baltimore with that beautiful pink and the Lord Baltimore with a big, bold red flower. And then finally, the rudbeckias. I want to call those the workhorses of our summer garden. And I love to grow rudbeckia herbstone. I love the height and I love the tall, tall candelabra effect with bold yellow flowers at the top. They just bloom in July. And then once they fade, I cut those flowers off and we get a nice second bloom to enjoy throughout the late August and into September. So no matter what you do, if you've got just absolutely no color or even just a little bit of color, I encourage you to go to your local garden center and your local public garden and ask questions to enrich your garden with summer color. Just one way to feel really alive in the summertime is to have a brightly colored garden. So I do hope you visit your local garden center or public garden to fill in any of the gaps that you have. And speaking of public garden, Peggy, yeah. we have a question right Actually, good to see you again. You've got the two Peggy's here on Virginia Home Grow. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got Paul in Richmond, and he's wondering, can the public visit Tufton Farm, and are there any events there? Yes. Funny, Paul should ask. Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, we've already had two open houses in April and May, but there's a third one in, in October, October 12th, and that's the, um, the uh, fall open house at Tufton Farm, and we'll have plant sales, but we'll also have apple tastings and speakers and tours and so it's it's a and it's a great time to get plants on sale but most of the plants are um sold at the sh at the shop at monticello or mail order of course sounds yeah. good so mm -hmm. and it's all on the website i'm sure that's right on the website and um uh, i'll just mention also that you can uh, follow us on our uh we have a facebook page now the monticello farm and garden facebook and a lot of the, the things we've talked about today and uh, are uh, you know profiled on this facebook page every day so it's a lot of fun it is a lot of fun. Yeah. So. Speaking of, Craig and Ashlyn, he wants to know if the Cox's prolific corn can be eaten on the cob. If it's t young. If yeah. it's young, it's so it has to be tender. Not, yeah, 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 like in the green stage, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's good to know, actually. <laughs> you can try. You can try. Yeah. We've, we've experimented a lot with eating dead corn, and it's like, it's just, yeah. there's a reason why they say it's for flour. For and yeah, <laughs> grind it, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, we have one from Marcus. Um, we have a viewer from Orange, and he's saying that his baptisias are covered with caterpillars right now. Oh, great. And I'm um, wondering, you know, will they destroy the plants? Do you have any advice? Do you have any experience? No, they, they really shouldn't destroy it. I mean, we talked about the butterfly that uses it, but there are a myriad of moths that use these plants as well. So you, you just need to um, keep maybe try to identify what they are and make sure that you know you're providing enough of the plant to make sure that they can go through their life cycle. Because sometimes you have you know the one show example of a plant in your garden, and then the butterfly that uses it comes and the caterpillars eat it down to nothing. So you just need to make sure you provide enough that that, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually I know this mm -hmm. very well because at Maymont and at my own home it's a Janista broom moth mm -hmm. and the Janista broom moth will totally decimate the leaves right. of the plant but like you say I wait for it to do its thing to finish its whole life cycle 
and then I just cut the plant back and it grows right back yeah. and it's just fine. It's a baptisia. This, these plants are like the iron workhorses <laughs> yeah, of the garden. They're very tough. Yeah. Very, very tough. So, um, Dan on Facebook wants to know, loves hearing about David Shields speak at the Harvest Heritage Festival last year, but yeah. besides the Cox Dent corn, are you growing any other vegetables he has written about? It's just fascinating. Oh, yes. Well, um, yes, the melons. Um, oh, gosh. He, he writes... His Facebook posts are like uh, chapters in a book. Uh, David <laughs> Shields is, is an amazing man. And they, we do have a number of the corn varieties, and um, gosh, nothing's coming to mind right now, but um, he shared so many things with us, and uh, he's, a, he's just a great friend of mine. He's not going to be here this year, but, uh, uh, but we ha we'll probably have him again in, in the future. Well, then go on Facebook and like him. That's right, and, and, um, and we've too. also posted a lot of his... Um, his, you know, we've reposted a lot of his uh, posts onto our Facebook page as well. Ooh. And this year, the Harvest Festival will be um, September 21st, so um, definitely come for that. Yeah. Beautiful time of year for yes, it. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> well, we've got some vegetable questions here, and um, is it too late to plant broccoli seeds? Uh, are no, you doing it tough? Yeah. 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 Seven yeah. to nine weeks before the, the yeah. last frost would be good, so you're, yeah. Yep. Yes. Mid-August, yeah. you know, early to mid-August. Definitely. Yeah. I, w I like to do it inside just because it's so hard yeah. to keep them watered. Um, mm -hmm. Some people, if they're germinating, they're fall greens. Uh, I actually picked this up from Ira Wallace in, in her book, um, Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast, where she'll plant the seeds, water it really well, and then put just, just like a, a board, a board down or something like that, and just check mm -hmm. under it every day or so, and that'll really keep the moisture in so that they have a fighting chance to germinate in this Particularly heat. Particularly in this heat, yes, <laughs> oh my. That's you can a do great that with idea. lettuce, too, to keep it cooler um, uh -huh. if you're trying to sow it in the, in the heat because a lot of the lettuce won't uh, germinate when it's really hot, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we also have, um, we've got, Debbie, when to plant those coal crops, and it's basically in the Richmond area. And if you're starting them from seed, we want to start right now, but then mm -hmm. as soon as they get tall enough, we want to be able to move them out into the garden. Mm -hmm. But I also was talking um, earlier um, with Marcus, and mm -hmm. you've got some advice because we all think about the cabbage worms. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, so cabbage white is, like I mentioned in the video when we're walking around Maymont, is mm -hmm. from Europe. It was introduced in the yeah. 18, 1860s, right. and mm -hmm. so a lot of people think they're a moth, but they're one of the early flying butterflies. And oh. um, you know, really rotating those <laughs> crops or planting other crops between your brassicas to keep it from erupting into a large outbreak of mm -hmm. those of those pests is really good because just like we talked about earlier, if you're controlling one caterpillar, you're going to be impacting others. So just you know, right. use use adaptive mm -hmm. management and, and IPM to make sure that you're um, addressing the the issue but not causing harm to other things. Mm -hmm. What an amazing example of co-evolution though, of just how they just lay just parallel to yes. the stem and they're the exact <laughs> hue of your kale plant. Yes. So they even have the little bit that looks like the waxy cuticle of the plant, it yeah. just kind of glows, you know, <laughs> and so um, yeah, definitely pick, picking then, them off is definitely possible. all of a sudden possible. you don't have leaves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But look for the size. So caterpillars, yeah. at least they, they are yeah. easy in the way that they, you know, they, they leave their droppings and they, yes. you can't mistake mm -hmm. caterpillar uh, mm -hmm. scat. It's really cool if you look at it up close. It's, they're actually like shaped like flowers if you look at the little segments that are shaped kind of like very <laughs> geometrically and they're green because that's what they're eating so if you yeah. see little holes and you see their droppings just th they're not far away no. yeah <clears throat> you start hand picking them off i pick yeah. them off by hand. chickens yeah. love them yeah. <laughs> that's right. yeah. that's right. so and then speaking of we've got um martin looked up the rock and deep purple salvia highlighted by edith carrier arboretum and it's a zone tolerance of 9 to 11 not our zone does this mean we should treat it as an annual or are there other varieties that are a perennial you know, I'm going to know that some of the varieties of salvias are definitely hardy in our area while others are not. And so I would treat this one particularly as an annual because it's a zone 9 to 10 and there's just no way it's going to make it. But it's it. really beautiful. And it's really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we can grow it every it. single year. I want it next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But on the other yeah. hand, you can also look into other salvias that are hardy in your, in your zone here, mm -hmm. um, particularly in Richmond. And then we have another one, um, Joe, uh, Joe from Crew is saying, can you recommend a source for milkweed and Queen Anne's lace? Do you sell them at the gift shop, the seeds? Oh, yes. Or? We do, well, uh, plants. The plants? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, butterfly weed and um, uh, swamp milkweed. Uh, those are two that we, we sell. We don't have the common milkweed, which mm -hmm. uh, you, is by the roadside, but that's really a one of the best yeah. uh, for yeah. monarchs. Yeah. 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 And I've been the same Anne's thing lace? as you, is that mm -hmm. you, you always want to leave the plants in the wild, but taking a few seeds, if you're mm -hmm. net increasing the population, 
you're, you're, it spreads from underground rhizomes as well as the seeds. So if you just put a few of those seeds in your garden, you're gonna have a patch in like a year or two. And I'm not being greedy about it. I'm very, very frugal. I just oh, need sure. I just need a few plants to get going because yeah. the whole meadow is gonna come real right. quick. And That's why they make so many seeds, just like insects though. They don't all make it. So if you give give it a, a loving environment, you may be helping the plant as well. Yeah, Peggy? we do have, we do have, they do sell seed of the, of the butterfly weed too. I forgot to say mm. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, very Sounds beautiful. like a trip out to Monticello. That's right. <laughs> or, yeah, online. <laughs> or online. <laughs> um, Jackie's on Facebook, loves beautiful garden, have no business having one of my own to care for. What do you recommend as a grow over everything, needs no care plant slash oh seeds that I can throw over everything and get what I'm looking for? Does not much such of a thing exist? It's called hiring a professional. Um, <laughs> but FYI, the previous gardeners planted a variety of flowers because grass just doesn't do well in our yard. I would encourage you to reach out and ask somebody yeah. um, in, a, in the community, go to your local garden center to come and hire them and have a consultation and ask them to walk through this garden with you and ask them to personally give some suggestions right there on your mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. If you're having mm -hmm. problems getting grass and it sounds like you need a soil test to be identify what's going on with that soil. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you can go to your local garden center and go to your mm -hmm. local public garden and many of the gardeners there also do consultation on the mm -hmm. side. So I would encourage you to reach out and to bring somebody in for an hour, maybe two. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you'll find that very rewarding and very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and also, sometimes if you move into a new place that someone's been gardening there for a while, you may want to just wait and watch and see what mm -hmm. happens. True. There might exactly. be some wonderful very true. Uh, flowers yes. that go are growing through the season that will come up. Sure. Um, a lot yes. of people are turning to clover as a sort of cover crop in place of grass, and they yeah. sell um, bulk commercial seeds that are pretty affordable mm -hmm. these days as well. Yes, so there's lots of alternatives. So That's just, right. I, I wish we could spend, we could almost spend a whole show on your yard. <laughs> 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 so, um, big question is how to keep Japanese beetles off of crepe myrtles. Does anybody mm. have any advice on those? Trap them. Yeah, trap. <laughs> but you yeah. attract them. But you have to put the hormone trap, the pheromone trap, away from yes. yeah. what yeah. you want because they want to be able to draw those beetles away, yes. not draw them to. Correct. Mm -hmm. So treat um, them as larvae to get the milky spore. In, mm -hmm. in your put them in grounds. your lawn. They're coming up to the surface in August, and they'll be going back down. So now is yeah, the time, time to time, get yeah. them. So yeah. Olive tree care, we have Claudette from Richmond. She's got a young olive tree, oh. and she's wondering how long will it take to produce the olives, and should she bring the tree inside over winter? Ah, oh, we need Gabrielli here yeah. from Monticello. <laughs> yes, we have some very old olive trees that we've been growing, but um, they do take a few years before they're going to start to produce, but they also need the, this cold treatment, and um, he leaves them outside until it's 17 degrees, and then we pull them in to some protection in a shed. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they can take it cold, um, but uh, you, I think you do need some of that cold weather to get it to actually produce uh, to flower and mm. produce fruit. Yeah. Some, something we'll have to learn more about and post on our Facebook page. Yeah. So yeah. Reach That's out fine. to Gabrielle and find out. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for being on the show. I'm excited that we had such a great combination of expertise here. Yeah, and yeah. we're yeah. excited yeah. and I truly appreciate it. So, Pat, in a quick bit, where are sure. we going next month? I'm going to talk with Chantel Bingham of the Seaville Food Justice Network. Well, I'm going to be learning about foraging. Matter of fact, we're going to be meeting with the, with the crew tomorrow to do so. So we're excited to be able to show you what's not only in your garden to eat, but what is also outside and beyond. So I look forward to seeing you next month and I thank you for watching. Funding for Virginia Homegrown is made possible by Strange's Florist, Greenhouses, and Garden Centers. Serving Richmond for over 75 years with two florist shops, two greenhouses, and a garden center located throughout the metro Richmond area. Strange's, every bloom in time. Wild Birds Unlimited, providing bird food, feeders, and garden accessories. Products to enjoy nature in your own backyard. 
New location next to Wegmans in Midlothian and also at Pump Road and Three Chopped. And by the Nanshard Morganson Charitable Fund.